How do you do like, uh, how many shows do you try to do at a time and how many weeks do you go without recording? So Which, you have like back material. So we travel about what, every six weeks? Yeah, about every six weeks. And make 16 shows? 16 to 17? 20-ish. Maybe? Yeah, we should really be trying to get 20. Yeah. If we hit 20, that essentially, you should be able to do 20 in 10 days. What's your average lag from recording to air really like depends we just put the most timely ones out first and if mm. there's ones that aren't very time sensitive they'll wait till the end of the, you know till we're running out of shows but when we're booking we know some you mm. know we we will yeah. know which are time sensitive which aren't but yeah if you think like if we're away for 10 days we're going to release five of the shows we make in those 10 days and you got 15 left that buys you five more weeks to your next trip and how many do you how many episodes do you do per week three three 150 a year 151 three how many are you doing now? Well, Competition. Yeah. I was I was doing two plus. Now I'm trying to go I'm trying to go three to four. I'm really trying to do four now. But that just started. How long are they? Today's was 17, but the average is 30. And yeah. I can go up to about 55. You can get away with it, I think, if they're shorter. Yeah. The sweet spot for us is three. Yeah. If you if you yeah, go to average four, length is about 90 minutes, right? About. Yeah, about that. Because if you go to four, you, you see a dip off. Sure. Okay. Any buddy just podcasters. Can't get through all the content. <laughs> Here's some tips for you. Yeah. <laughs> if, if you get to four, yeah. you just, you just, yeah. So, so I like some people think, oh, they start with one and they go yeah. two and they're like, they finally go, oh, I'm going to do one every day. And when they get right. to one every day, they just realize we'll just stop listening. Right. So it's a bit too much. But yeah. I think three is a good spot. Yeah. You could probably release one kind of every other day but if you did that you would probably want to make them quite different like make sure you had like a techie one a macro one sure and then you bring in different people but uh you enjoying doing it i i'm really liking it because the videos are helping me drive my research which is specifically my research tool my data and the charts like that i'm I'm in the data now every day more than I was before I was doing videos based on my own data. Like I'm doing guests, but not that many guests. I'm mostly doing my own analysis. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're the guest now. Good to see you again, man. Good to see uh, you, Pete. Australia last time. Got around the whole world with you. <laughs> We're going to get you to the UK next. That was, I mean, that was a lot of fun and I yeah. have had... Daniel Batten on since then, Checkmate. Uh -huh. He's so uh, good, Checkmate. I so had good. Dan on. Uh, so I've made great relationships from there. That was a really amazing trip. Yeah, I, I, we enjoyed it. We will probably be back there at some point. Uh, but we're focused on Bedford next. But it was cool, man. I thank you for coming. Were, were you there for something insane, like two days? Yes, <laughs> two days. And I had to get back for class. Well, we appreciate you, man, coming to be our headliner. Uh, okay, man. Listen, I want to talk to you about ETFs. How have ETFs changed the game? How has it changed everything that you're looking at? So I have been thinking about Bitcoin ETFs and what they will do to the price and the demand for many years. I recently went back and actually read my article from 2018, The Business of Bitcoin Cold Storage. Is that the 50 million Bitcoin article? No. No? No. Uh, this one was about how there's going to be a fight over the custody of Bitcoin. Okay. So there'll be custodians, but there'll also be ETF managers who won't custody it themselves. They'll hire custodians. So the custodians will fight on who's going to custody. The ETF managers will fight over who's going to manage and everybody will be fighting for the 21 million coins. And so I've been thinking about it for a long time, but the demand that actually happens when the things go live and the jump off price point together are starting to accelerate my estimation of when we can get to gold, which would be about half a million, and then, of course, a million. Okay, so 
When did you originally think this would happen? Say go. I've never, and that's the thing is I've never been comfortable with saying okay. a, a date or a year. Like I think that in three years, five years, 10 years, I've never felt comfortable making that prediction because I understand what Bitcoin is and where its place is in amongst asset classes. Yeah. But trying to pinpoint when Bitcoin gets to $500,000 is a really tough game. So I've never felt comfortable doing that. All of a sudden, the last couple of weeks, it like 500 grand comes into focus when you start to do the math. And you start to realize buying whole Bitcoins is going to be very hard, very expensive. I, um, I always feel like I could have stacked harder. And I stacked pretty hard this last few years. Still could have stacked harder. We all could have. It was all on, the, like the rising was there for us. I think though perhaps, I think a lot of people felt cheated by the last bull market because we you know, had a few people blow up and sell off their Bitcoin and we never really did what we expected. We don't say this time it feels different. <laughs> you said it. <laughs> Something feels different, man. I had a close friend. I have a close friend who, uh, overseas friend who lost all of his holdings with Celsius. No. Fuck. And I saw him and I had a conversation with him about it after the fact. I didn't know this because he's abroad and I, I met him at, when I was away from the country and I saw the pain that was really tough. That was really tough. And he, and he said, yeah, I reached out to you and you said you, you had never heard of Celsius. And it's, I think about that when you talk about the last run, because there were a lot of people like that, that got swept into, again, the crypto side of things. And uh, people don't give you credit enough, Pete, for having Bitcoin smack dab in the middle of your brand. It is very important to emphasize Bitcoin, 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 not crypto, not DeFi. All of these things might exist and continue to exist, but the focus, our focus is on Bitcoin, I think, and it's, that's really important. Yeah, that's pure chance though. That was just, uh, <laughs> that, was, I, that was here in LA. But you know what, Pete, but it's it, over time, you, you lean into it, your content is directed around calling out scammers. I mean, your- One of my sponsors was scammed everyone. <laughs> Two it, of them. It wasn't by chance though, because it start, It was always called What Bitcoin Did, but you used to do shitcoin stuff. Yeah, I look, I mean, <clears throat> look. And you I appreciate, decided I to I appreciate go. the kind words, Nick, but uh, the show started as a shitcoin show as well. I would cover cryptos. Um, uh, you probably wouldn't have known the show, show when it first started. That wasn't for long. The first show was recorded here in LA, November 17th, 2017, with Luke Martin. Um, the name was invented here in Venice. Uh, but I, I covered crypto. It was primarily Bitcoin. But that's why it wasn't by chance, though, because you then decided to go Bitcoin only. So only it was a conscious decision. Because I got bullied into it. <laughs> well, good. <laughs> I got bullied into it. Uh, and then uh, a couple of my... Sponsors have turned out not to be great. BlockFi, obviously, that wasn't great. Um, but I am focused on Bitcoin. And we are all, you know, trying to do business. Like you talk about stacking harder. We all could have stacked harder. But I invested into my own business. I also was looking for sponsors. You, when you're looking for sponsors, it's, it's an interesting, you know, dynamic. You want someone that you believe is going to represent you well, you also have to pay bills. Yep. So, and you, you know, you own the mistakes and... Have you uh, had to turn it, you don't have to name them, but if you have had to turn any sponsors away where you're like, fuck, that's good money. Uh, I have definitely turned sponsors away. <laughs> but that's what people don't realize. We, I mean, I've turned down millions in sponsorship. Uh, I mean, some of it is just outright scams and... and uh, crypto shit, but it comes in. You have, you have, to, make a, you have to make a choice. Yes, absolutely. We're thrilled to be sponsored by River. It's a Bitcoin only company and it just, it fits really well with what we're doing. Alex, Alex is a good guy as well. Alex is tremendous, yeah. All right, well tell us about the numbers on these ETFs then. Yes, so. What, is, what are you seeing? 
60 billion total assets under management. A lot of that was already baked in with Grayscale. We yep. understand that. But the key number here right now is about 200,000 coins have gone into the ETFs post or net inflows. So GBTC, just rounding here, had about 600,000 going in. We're at about 800, it's 850, about thousand Bitcoin total. So if you strip out the grayscale, what we started with, almost a quarter million Bitcoin have come into the new vehicles on a net basis in a very short amount of time. And we have to think about what, how the price moved for just those 200,000 coins, how much USD is behind there in demand, because we don't know how many Bitcoin they'll get. Mm. But we can estimate relative to the rest of assets, basically, and that's the work I've been doing recently, how much of that can rotate into Bitcoin. We've always thought about that. That's why for a long time, we've thought Bitcoin can pass gold. Why can it pass gold? Because gold is about 10 to $15 trillion in size, but the size of stocks plus bonds plus real estate is half a quadrillion in size. So that's 500 trillion. And you think a lot of that's going to potentially rotate into Bitcoin? In the past, my point is that in the past, when I first understood Bitcoin, I thought, yes, Bitcoin can attract several trillion in market cap because the size of the rest of the world's money is about 500 trillion. Mm. So some of that will go in and Bitcoin at the time was about 10, 20, 30 billion market cap. I was, this is a, this is an obvious buy. This is very undervalued. But now that we are already at 1.4 trillion in market cap, it's an easy 10 X from here based off of the fact that only only 20 or so billion in net cash has come into the new ETFs, only 20 billion. But that is now the potential size of that 20, I believe is a, is a trillion, easy trillion. And what will the trillion buy them? How many coins? That's the exercise I've started to do. And you get to the really large Bitcoin prices, you start to get to them really easily because the jump off point is at 70 grand and the trillion of ETF capital that I believe could potentially come in over the next few years, it hasn't started yet. So was the problem when you were initially trying to value it, you underestimated the lack of supply? No, it didn't have to do with the supply versus the demand. It was really the, the pipes and the timing and the market dynamics. Because when you watch Bitcoin go from 20 to three, right, which my, was my first full cycle, watched it, I watched it go from sub one to 20 to three. Yeah. Okay, lived it, wrote it. Then you realize when it goes from 20 to three, this is a very immature asset class. It got to 20 on a lot of fluff. There isn't enough real capital to catch it and so the ride from 20 to three, it's almost like inevitable. The second time from 70 down to 15, 17, that drawdown, again, we talk about FTX, the fake selling, uh, the leveraged coins, and you realize that it still was immature. There wasn't a demand vehicle to catch it. And it wasn't a demand vehicle to keep stable, real Bitcoin tucked away in demand. So there wasn't any of that dynamic behind either of those bull runs. So when it goes from 70 to 15, I write to my readers, yep, like this is what we expect from a, an immature asset class. And all of a sudden, the maturity turns on and you look at the you look at the market so now you look at the demand you look at the daily etf inflows and you just understand this is money that's going to stick around it's driving the realized price up which is basically just this 
when the coins move on chain into those vaults, it's being struck at 60 and 70 grand now. That is a cost basis of 60, 70 grand. Those people are in it for the 10 bagger. That is just starting now. It's the, it's not, the, um, it's not a misestimation of the supply or the demand. It's the new dynamics of the demand that changes the game for Bitcoin. So I'm not saying we won't get another 80% cycle, but it might be from a level that's much higher than past cycles. I don't know. I don't want to project, you know, the price up and down. My comfort in starting to verbalize 100K, I got really comfortable late last year. The court case was passed. I, I, you know, wrote, it's time to prepare for six-figure Bitcoin. I started writing about it. I want the readers to understand it's time to prepare yourself. We're going 100K. It's happening. Now you can actually start, right? Because I want to be not fantastical in my analysis. So I'm not talking about million-dollar Bitcoin all the time because I'm doing real day-to-day analysis of global macro and Bitcoin. Now part of the day-to-day analysis is, man, it can go really, it can go really high now. The demand, the pi- Caitlin Long, I just did a show with her. She described it as the pipes are open. There's no better way to set the scene for it because I traded the market. So I, I, I see the pipes, I, I've seen them. I, I've witnessed them, I've lived them, I've wired, you know, I've wired a billion plus dollars and I've done billion plus trades in treasury securities. So I have been involved in the plumbing system w- where the trillions lie, basically. You see, I've, you've I've seen, seen them move. It. You've seen the pipes. You've seen I've seen moves. them. What is Bitcoin within these pipes? That, and I'll say in that, there'll be certain times where people are buying gold, certain times where people are buying oil, blah, blah. What is Bitcoin's placing all of this? It's a brilliant question. The answer is the internet, but you set the scene with, it is an alternative to stocks for some portion, not like that Bitcoin is an ownership of future cash flows of good businesses, which is why people own stocks, but people also own, own stocks because there's no other place to put their money. So it's a really good interim vehicle. It's property that can't really be devalued. The share, the share, the companies can print shares, but if the companies are operating in the interest of the shareholders, the shareholders will benefit. That's property. It's not cash. It's not currency. So people own stocks, but they own stocks plus And that plus can come out into Bitcoin. They own gold. Some of that will, some of that demand is because they want physical metal, but some of it is because they don't know what else to do with the cash because they can't hold the cash. The cash is the shit. It's the piece of shit. So you can't own the cash. So you have to do something else with it. So you own gold. Some of that comes out into Bitcoin. Some of the government bond stuff comes out into Bitcoin. We've, we can talk about that. It's a much bigger pile of money, but some of that can come into Bitcoin as people realize that it's not the 30 year store of value that you need because the real rate is going to be negative when you, so some of it will come out. And then of course, real estate, because real estate's not liquid. So why would I hold flats or even a REIT with quarterly liquidity when I can own Bitcoin? All Bitcoin will steal a little bit of all of that that has long been the thesis. And now the pipes are open for the stocks and the bonds specifically to actually go out and into Bitcoin. All of that is there. But your question is answered by the internet. The internet is where people live now. So even if the Bitcoin ETF is not done in the native internet way, and it's not, it's done in a traditional, the reason for owning it is that we live in the time of the internet. And so Bitcoin is the money. So, and part of what I just wrote about is that it's actually an alternative for money market funds, not that money market funds and Bitcoin risk can be 
comparable. It's much more comparable to equity, let's say, in measuring risk. There's much more volatility there. Money market funds are a par instrument, but people think of them as cash. You should explain because, what money market funds okay. are. Yeah, yeah. Layered money, right? We have different types of money and money is ranked amongst different types of money. So if you have cash, that cash only has exposure to the central bank. I'm talking about paper money. We can have paper money, but most people have checking account money. That's a deposit. It's a money that is issued to you by your bank. So when you think about your checking account, what is it? Do you actually carry around a deposit slip with your current balance? No, it's basically the number on your app is your balance. You think of it as cash because you can draw cash from it, but it's really just a bank liability and that's the type of money. What people think, what people hold as cash in their investment portfolios is something called a money market fund share. So if you have an investment portfolio of a billion dollars, let's say you're a corporation, you make money every day, you have money, you have this pile of cash. What do you do with it? You're not going to want to buy stocks with the cash. Your shareholders aren't paying you to buy stocks. They're paying you to operate a business. So you basically just want cash. So how do you hold the cash? Do you hold it in a checking account? No, because again, your shareholders aren't paying you to lend to a bank. So you take that cash and you purchase a cash instrument called a money market fund. And it's a, it's a fund, but the holdings of the fund are all treasury bills, for example. So instruments that are cash-like never trade far from par, meaning they are always worth $100. Or, or about $100, or, you, or some of the assets are repo, so you lend money to banks, but they post treasuries as collateral to you, so you have safe, you just have safe everything in the fund. You own the fund, and that's a share, and that share is like cash to the investor. Why is it like cash? Because it matures every night. Hmm. So the next morning, it's a brand, it's just cash you can draw. You can wire it out. It, it's not locked in. You don't have to sell something. Every night it matures. So money market fund shares are the cash form of choice for the trillion, the trillions club. Okay. Because deposits are a cash of choice for only people that are either have balances of less than 250,000 in the United States or doing poor risk management. Because that's the amount you're insured for at the bank. Correct, that's the FDIC, Federal, De Federal Deposit Insurance, which is a 1930s innovation post FDR's executive order 6102, the gold seizure. And money market funds, are they just private? Operations? They are private operations, but there are money market funds that are designated, it's called 2A7, and that is the seat I used to sit in. I used to trade money markets for a 2A7. That means the holdings can only be treasuries or treasury repo or other very similar instruments, meaning you can't have any bank debt, you can't have any CDs in there. It you doesn't can, sound like a complicated operation. It's, I mean, it's, vin, it's, it's vanilla in that you are owning things that are pre-allowed and very limited. Mm. There is an art, of course, in managing that money as you have daily liquidity needs. So you have to trade in and out of instruments all the time to make sure everybody gets par and you out yield your benchmark, which is a three month bill or something like that. You actually try to go out and make more money than if they were to just buy the bill. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, why would they pay you? So it was a, I mean, it's a brilliant seat to, to grow up in and to, to learn my, you know, to learn how to function in these markets. But the answer to your question is the risk of the holdings for a government money market fund, also known as 2A7 fund, the risk is basically nil. It's daily liquidity and the holdings are all treasuries or treasury-like instruments. There are prime money market funds that are allowed to own credit. So like, a, like the Lehman Brothers 
bankruptcy triggered a financial crisis because Lehman debt, commercial paper, short-term Lehman debt failed. So the money market funds that held Lehman paper were not able to hold par. That was called breaking the buck. And the, that fund traded to 97 cents and the whole system basically shut down. Huh. So that's the importance <laughs> of money market funds holding par. Yeah. And so now that we have government money market funds uh, segregated, we have this trillion, like I was saying, this trillion dollar cash pool. It's now six trillion in size. This is the safe money of the banks, investment houses, pensions, et cetera. That cash pool can be analogous to Bitcoin in that this is money that we're not ready to buy stocks with or that we want to just keep. And I see, an, I see a rotation out of the 150 trillion of stocks and bonds into Bitcoin alongside money market funds so that they'll have this cash pool in money market fund shares of 6 trillion and this Bitcoin cash pool of 6 trillion. And, you know, that gets Bitcoin to 300K. Okay. It's already a quarter of the way there. Yeah. So when, when you look at something like BlackRock and they've bought 215,000 Bitcoin, is it now? I think it might even be higher now, but yeah, yeah something so like let's that. Let's just say 210, 215,000 Bitcoin. Do you have some kind of idea of what the makeup of that is? Are there different parts of their business that are buying it? Are there... Yeah, you know, they would there be. I'm um, not the percentages, but you know, is some of it financial advisors, you know, putting it into a certain basket of you know portfolio for their customers? Is some of them buying large amounts on behalf of their customers? Is it pension? Like I've got no idea what the makeup every day is. Whether de does demand come from all different parts of their business? Right now, we don't have great statistics on the makeup of the shareholders of the BlackRock ETF. Do you think they would provide that? Somewhere? We will get much more data. Okay. I promise you that within, I don't know, three, six to 12 months, we're going to get plenty of data on who owns these shares. A lot of it is publicly mandated in just that we'll show, it'll show up on the holdings page on the Bloomberg screen. So we'll just, everyone will be able to see it, who owns the, the shares. But I think the current buyer base of the ETF so far are retail and invest and investing houses, meaning that the financial advisors demand is not has not showed up yet. Okay. The reason that that hasn't showed up yet, and we uh, we are understanding this from people that are in the industry, that Morgan Stanley and Merrill Lynch, which are two of the largest wealth managers. So let's just break this down a little bit. You have the buy side or asset management. That is people, that is the money of hedge funds and mutual funds and money managers that are money, managing money on behalf of institutions governments, corporations, universities. So like my clients, when I was on the desk, money market funds, it's NASDAQ companies, it's major universities, and it's the state of California who are your clients and you're investing their money. That money- Under what mandate? Yeah, under what rules? I was operating under, we, we were a fixed income manager. Our duty was to manage safe pools of cash. So they hire us for that. They hire other managers for stocks. They hire other managers for riskier bonds or something like that. All of that money is now, I believe, open to the BlackRock ETF and is starting to come in. Okay. Retail demand, meaning the individual person with their own brokerage control is starting to come in. So those are the two places where I believe there's demand. I also believe there's demand from overseas sovereign wealth funds that are now able to, but that's more in the asset management, that first category. There's this whole other category of money, 
which is American retirement money. That is sitting in wealth managers under wealth manager advisors. That's financial advisors. So that's the Merrill Lynch, Merrill Lynch wealth management or Morgan Stanley wealth management divisions. That pool of capital is several trillion dollars in like 401k assets and all of that. Though Bitcoin ETFs are no, not yet on the menu. Okay. And, and are being approved by some as we speak and might be turned on for Q2, Q3 of this year so that Morgan Stanley financial advisor can ping all their clients and say, hey, we're now comfortable with a 1% position. That's our default. We're going to rotate into own some Bitcoin as a, you know, alongside your 1% GLD position. So they might call up everyone that has, that they've already had the conversation with in the last 10 years. Hey, do you want one to 5% gold in your fund, in your, in your portfolio? Because you fit the criteria for a 5% gold allocation. They'll get the call. It'll be like, do you want a 5% Bitcoin allocation or a 1% also? Do, will they have to call each customer and get their customers or can there be scenarios whereby they customers are subscribed to a certain like for example when, when I, I remember I had my pension they didn't go through all the individual products they said do you want a uh, uh, low medium or high risk right. weighted basket and I went medium and I've got no idea what they got me they just did it all for me and that is a good question I'll, I'll, some people like to know yeah. and so that's what they do but some people just own, and this is more the passive side of things, they just own a 2050 fund. So like people might be familiar with Fidelity has 2030, 2035, like they have a year a attached to it. And it's basically how old is, when, what year was your child born? Add 18 to it or 25 and you buy that fund and you target. So they, you know, stack and Is that a college fund? There are college funds that, that are like that. If but, you're only in 18 years, though. <laughs> exactly. College yeah. fund. There are college funds that are like that. But in general, there are funds that have, and there are fund of funds yeah. that they own different things in the fund. So we've now seen Fidelity publicly state that 1% of their, I believe it's their Canada ETF, multi sector ETF. 1% of it will own FBTC, the Fidelity ETF. Yeah. So the shareholders of the ETFs are now officially on record other ETFs and other mutual funds that want a 1% position for diversification for their multi-asset portfolio. So BlackRock has also I forget the exact fund has said, hey, we're now putting some of this multi-asset fund into IBIT. And so a lot of those, but the individual retirees that have money, those Bitcoin getting into those funds, even if it's without them directly knowing, but just as like, oh, this is part of our little basket that mm -hmm. we have for our global macro basket or our gold basket. We put a little bit, they might not be aware of that transition, but that transition hasn't happened yet. That's what starts to make me realize that $70,000 for Bitcoin today is, is very cheap because 1.4 trillion isn't gonna store what is coming. It's just not gonna, it's just not gonna fit. Are you gonna tell us the numbers that came up when you were putting them into your spreadsheets? The range. The money market fund benchmark for me is a really good immediate price target, okay. six trillion. Gold at 10 trillion, 15 trillion, I'm starting to hate it now because we don't actually know how much gold there is. I read a book recently about hidden gold, Germany and Japan, all this hidden gold uh, that was hid away World War II. We don't know how much gold there is. And that is not very liquid either. And it's not connected to the pipes that I'm talking about. 
So I've kind of kicked gold out of my framework for a benchmark. It's made it easier to focus on a more realistic benchmark, which is money market funds, which are about six, six trillion, which would put Bitcoin's market cap, I mean, which would put Bitcoin's price at about 300,000. That is now my immediate price target over the next, I still want to say over the next few years, because I don't know. I just don't feel like making a time. Yeah, you don't have uh, to say. Yeah, but six, six trillion is coming no. for Bitcoin. That is, when I, when I look at the amount of capital that can rotate from other asset classes, it makes sense to me that an internet-based cash pool and a banking-based cash pool can sit side by side on a balance sheet. And I think that from an overseas perspective, we're underestimating the demand. Yep. Because the dollar people still don't understand why they need an alternative cash pool that's not denominated in dollars. Even if it's through a Bitcoin ETF share, then your portfolio is going to look wonky when Bitcoin goes up three to five X. You're just going to have all this Bitcoin. You're just going to have all this. You're going to have all these assets in dollars, but the asset underlying it is going to be Bitcoin. And so I see that, I just see that rising to equal what the world is considering as a cash slush fund or as this Michael Saylor calls it property and not currency. That's the way to think about it. It's property because currency would not be held in money market funds. Currency is held in deposits. You don't need to hold currency long-term because it is a current, it flows. Bitcoin is an asset and money market funds is a cash pool that's ready to buy assets. And, the, and Bitcoin the, accomplishes both at the same time. It's the cash pool and it's the asset. And the instability and unpredictability of the price in the short term doesn't matter to the money market funds. They can take that risk. I'm not talking about money market funds themselves owning Bitcoin. And I'm not even talking about- No, no, I mean, about, the, the companies who would be putting the money into the money market funds, they would take a little bit of a, more of a punt on Bitcoin. I'm not even saying that they pull their money out of the, sh the shares and put it into Bitcoin. Okay. It's from stocks, bonds, real estate. Yeah. And that money being piled up into a, se a separate cash pool like instrument alongside the six trillion. Huh. It's the benchmark. It's not where the money is coming from. The money is coming from the 150 trillion in stocks and bonds. And then the et cetera is the real estate, which is not connected in the pipe. So it takes longer. The 150 trillion there is sitting for Bitcoin. What, what's starting to bend my mind is that if only 1 trillion comes in, the 1 trillion doesn't mean that the 1.4 trillion market cap goes to 2.4 trillion. Of course not. And that's the part that's shaking like my understanding of where the price can go. Because a trillion, a trillion more coming in, because remember, it's only been 20 billion yeah. that's come in net uh, after GBTC's original, they already had a bunch of under management. So the new money, I easily see that being 1 trillion. The 1 trillion, how many coins are they going to get for it? I don't know, not a lot. So if they get 2 million coins, <laughs> it puts the price at a million. So why is that? Explain that. Okay, so the it's just a market cap calculation, okay. right? So if the, by the last, let's say they buy, they're able to buy 2 million coins. All the ETFs around the world yep. are able to buy 2 million coins. They are able to accomplish that for the, pro, the aggregate value of all of those coins is going to be struck at the price at which the last coin is purchased. So a trillion can come into the market. And if the last coin is purchased at, or let's say 
if the last coin is purchased at $1 million and they will have accomplished 200,000 coins, it means that the aggregate value of those 2 million coins is $1 trillion. But does that not ignore the fact that when Bitcoin hits like 100K, 500K, whatever it is, more supply is going to come on the market as people are like, fuck, I'm rich. That, that is where the coins are going to come from, Danny. That's where the coins you, come from. The they're coin, not getting my coins. They because, all hands. because right now there's a couple million coins on exchanges, right? Yeah. So I'm not saying that those coins disappear and then we start to get new coins. The exchanges will always have supply because new coins come online every time. I'm only talking about how many coins the world will be able to accomplish via the ETF vehicles. And I can't, my, here's the point here. I don't know how many coins, but my guess is that a trillion dollars is gonna come in. And so you don't, each hundred billion that comes in, it's gonna be at a higher price, of I'm course. assuming. Yeah. Each hundred billion that comes in, it's gonna be at a higher price. And each hundred billion that comes in, you have to then redo the calculation. Okay, now they were able to get this many coins with the hundred billion. Now they were able to get this many coins with the next hundred billion. And I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about the trillion US dollars that are going to come in. And I'm think I'm looking at the supply of Bitcoin that's out there and I'm looking at HODL waves, mm -hmm. okay? And I'm looking at the coin age and I'm looking at estimates of coins that are lost or never again to be found. How many realistically coins exist on exchanges plus in holders that are willing to sell plus in long-term holders that are actually going to sell when the price hits 500K because they can't pass up the USD or the rotation into real estate or other assets how many coins are actually available? Is it 15? Definitely not. Mm -hmm. Is it 10 million coins? Probably not. No way. So then you're like, so how many coins is it? So I don't know. It's, a, it's I don't know. Is it melting your brain? It has melted my brain in the last few weeks because as Danny and I are speaking, you, you get into Bitcoin thinking that, hey, this can be a 20 to $50 trillion asset because the size of all wealth is 500 trillion. So some of that can come into Bitcoin and that makes sense in an internet world, obviously. Then time goes along and Bitcoin goes to a trillion for the first time. Then it goes to one and a half trillion for the first time. Then you're like, oh, we're only, we're only 10X from our original estimate. But five years ago, we were 50X from it. So then you get closer and you're like, holy shit, it's here. And the jump off point is so high in price. That's what's really hurting my brain when I'm thinking about the price. So I'm trying to get comfortable writing about one, not even 100 anymore. I'm gonna try to make myself comfortable with writing about $6 trillion Bitcoin because only a 4X from here, and I think that it can happen on only a couple hundred billion in demand. Not that you don't need the trillion, you don't even really need the trillion to get there. Do you think these people really understand Bitcoin, or do you think they just, it's just digital gold? It's, it's, yeah, what do you think they think they buy? What do you think they think they're buying? I think, Are they buying magic ETF money? I, <laughs> I, think they, I think they understand enough. What is it they understand? You got to, you got to have some. You got, you got to have some understanding. Government doesn't control it, and the banks can't print it, and it's digital. I think that's enough for them. I think they've gotten it. Okay. If it's not even an if, the understanding of why that is important is with the people of the world. It's with them. They're there for it. No government, no banks. And they're not looking at it like, oh, but the bank, the ETF manager uses the bank and they use the, they don't care about that. They believe in rule of law. 
which makes the property in the ETF the same as if they were, they, they own GLD, they don't have gold bars in their vault. Trust me, the, 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 the sovereigns do. And even some of them hold it in New York, you know? So they don't, they, the self-sovereign Bitcoin holder that is empowered, that never has to trust another bank will always be here. That person's never going away. They started, they started this in terms of the demand, right? They didn't start Bitcoin, they didn't create it. We had brilliant cryptographers that created this tool. Then we had psychotic anti-government people that said, this is the way. And then when it worked and they proved that, here's another having, here's another having, look, it's scarce. No government controls it. No government can shut it down. China mining ban. Nobody cares. Bitcoin, uh, US banning FUD. Nobody cares. ETFs live. So the, the, the self-sovereign, he started, he and she, they, they're there. They're there forever. They're here. They're not going anywhere. The next level is big money saying, I want non-government money too. I'll trust the rule of law, but I want that too. What's big money? What do you mean big money? Big money is institutional money. Pension funds. Big money is anybody that doesn't want the wallet because it's too much. They'd rather trust the rule of law and, 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 uh, and, and I hope, I hope to my core that the service providers of the future in Bitcoin associated custody are a new breed and not the old guard. Yes, BlackRock and Fidelity, but Fidelity, they set up their whole, they set up their own shop and they were mining, they've been mining, or they started mining over a decade ago and they are not using doing Coinbase, custody. right? They're using their own and they built their own product so that counts, even as old guard, it's new product line that they hired people to work on that know Bitcoin. They've had some very legit Bitcoiners at Fidelity. They have, and they are, I mean, they're part of Bitcoin history. They, they have a role in Bitcoin history. They have a role in my understanding of Bitcoin because when I saw Fidelity, was mining Bitcoin. I was like, what is mining? <laughs> I was like, what, what, what do you mean that they're doing that? That this must be something serious. It's not like I blindly followed Fidelity into Bitcoin eight years ago. It's part of my own research process. It's a, it's a, it's an alarm. So they're part of history. So big money is anybody that prefers rule of law to their own wallet because it's too big or there are too many stakeholders. So any fund essentially is not going, the, the, the fund investors are not going to want their p portfolio manager doing key storage. They're gonna want him to con him or her to contract it. Isn't it funny now that El Salvador is doing their own key storage? Do you see this? It, what, do you, what happened with Germany? We've told this story before. What happened with Germany when they wanted their gold back? It took them years mm -hmm. and ships. And we still have Venezuela's gold in London. Yes. So it make, it's like Fidelity. Fidelity said, we're, do, we're gonna have a product and we're gonna do it in-house. So listen, I read uh, job listings of African Central, I wasn't looking for a job. I was just part of a research process years ago, African Central Banks looking for Bitcoin and cryptography experts. Now I haven't followed up on those listings, but my point is that you better figure it out for yourself. Yeah. Well, that, I mean, the tweet, what was the tweet he said, Naib Bukedi? I'll find like it. In, in Salvadorian territory. He was very, I think he was very specific with his words. Yes. I'm pretty sure he said it. Uh, I think one of the things that surprised me is how much Bitcoin they had. 
That surprised me as well. Yeah. He said, we've decided to transfer a big chunk of our Bitcoin to a cold wallet and store that cold wallet in a physical vault within our national territory. Yeah, within our national you can, territory. You can call it our first Bitcoin piggy bank. So a couple of things on that, by the way. Um, why just a chunk and why not all of it? Well, is that a flex about how much he's got? Is he saying this isn't everything when really it could yeah. be? Yeah, yeah. Um, secondly, obviously we won't know, or, or maybe we will, but who has the keys? What's the sign-off procedure? When does Naib Bukele run off with it all? Yeah, I just, I just <laughs> don't I just don't see... I understand the threat. But let, yeah, let's it? not trust him, though. Yeah, of course let's not trust him, but I just don't believe... Like, what's, he's a hero in that country. What's he going to do? What country is he going to run for? For now. Yeah, I know, I know, I know for now. But I, I believe he's one of the good guys. We'll see. I, yeah. I don't think you can say that for... Who knows what Naib Bukele will be in 10 years? Of course, of course. Let's just remain sceptical. Oh, yeah, yeah. But Naib, Naib has a pretty good track record so far. I don't think yes. he's trying to completely turn around the country, change his forces, become an absolute legend of the country only to steal the money. It just... But maybe he will. Either way... I do wonder who, what the setup is for something like that. Because whatever the setup is, there can be conclusion, collusion. So I just wonder how you even get around something like that. Mm. My recent thought about him was how long will he keep power? Because what he's doing is obviously... Working? I was going to say he is engaging in a revolution of sorts. And totally. so if he, so not even if he, my thought was, wait, well now he can't actually pass off power because what he's doing to like, cause the next- He needs to finish the project. The next leader will actually come in and tell the guards to move, open the door and <laughs> scan the, and scan the private key uh, and it. sweep the key. Yeah and steal the money, the next guy will almost certainly do it. So we don't know if, if, if Bukele will do it, but that means that he has to stay in power for a long time. So I don't have... Yeah, well, I think he... I think he my, my view is that it's a bad thing that he kind of broke the constitution to serve a, a second term. But it's a good thing that he is serving the second term in that see the project through. And I, my view is he'll probably do a third term, but maybe that's, a fourth. But, but that's that's what I'm saying is in my own projection, I can't see him letting go because no one is going to be able to execute his vision over a long... Bitcoin takes years to play out. Maybe, maybe. But, but, but yes, I think yes, because of that, he needs to execute the vision of El Salvador. But I think he needs to tell people what that vision is and put a timeline on it and allow them to vote on it. I don't think he could be a, I don't think he should be a forever uh, president, but. I work very hard, I should just say that. So I work very hard to not be a political scientist yeah, but that's and to really stay. Hard. And because, man, it's a, it is its own animal. Yeah. I really dislike politics a lot. Uh, I like I dislike domestic U.S. politics. I I like geopolitics in that it's a relationship between countries, but I hate analyzing politicians. What politicians might do, so I try to stay. That, that question, though, keep my distance. That question about what happens to the Bitcoin and the private keys at a nation state level. I never even thought about it. But it's a fascinating question. Yeah, it is. Uh, hopefully, they have a very strict protocol in place so it can actually be passed on. <laughs> Don't Hopefully. well think about it like this now. Instead of the nation state level, imagine now the rumored buyers uh, of the day, which is the Qatari and Emirati Saudi so sovereign wealth funds. I don't even know about PIF, the Saudi one, yeah. but the, the rumors are Qatar and UAE. Right, those are the rumors that we that we feel. UAE has done pro Bitcoin projects. Marathon is there. Uh, Qatar, we we've seen the associations, we've seen the flight logs and things like that. So we have we have a strong suspicion. So how are they storing it? And the answer is they're probably buying Ibit 
and FBTC. That is at the sovereign wealth fund level. The state level, even like somebody brought up to me that the Swiss National Bank it has been a big NASDAQ shareholder for many years. Part of their peg to the euro or keeping the Swiss, because the Swiss still have their own currency. But if, if their currency gets too volatile, it can disrupt their economy because their customers are European. And so you, you need to keep that very stable, especially in the new era of all these volatile movements. So they have to print Swiss francs to keep the currency pegged. What do they do on the other side of that? They're buying shares of tech companies and other, they're like a big shareholder of NASDAQ, uh, okay. of Apple and other companies. So what if they start printing to keep their currency peg and just buy e Bitcoin ETFs? They won't set up, trust me, because they need the pipes. It's, a, there's, it's in their open markets portfolio. They need it in a open pipe situation. So that's the central bank. So sovereign wealth funds, ETFs. Central banks, ETFs. Sovereigns like Bukele who need to be, need to literally protect themselves from IMF hit squads, CIA, all of that, he has to protect himself. That's true. So where is he gonna keep the keys? In a vault with the guards. That makes a lot of sense. He can't buy the ETF. So you have to think about who's doing it and why. So then, now who who's the next one? Uh, let's just say some Asian, some large Asian country, let's say either Japan or South Korea, makes, makes a strategic purchase. You still have to then do a game theory in each country of would it be the sovereign? Would it be the central bank? Who is in control? Right? There's all this who's in control, the Fed or Congress. Fed has chartered by Congress, but Fed is independent, quote unquote, independent. But Powell has to get confirmed. But how does he get nominated? And the Bank of England was nationalized decades ago. Before that, it was still a private bank. So every country is going to have a different situation. There's no easy answer to how they're going to own it. But if you do the thought exercise, a lot of it is going to be, it's going to have to be in ETFs. But even, even if it is in ETFs, it still could be stolen. The way the wealth of a nation could be stolen, whether it's an ETFs award. But who's going to steal Apple shares no, from the Swiss it, National Bank? No, what I mean is if you're, uh, you know, we know the history of previous El Salvador, uh, Salvadoran presidents, thieves and etc. If if somebody came in and after Bukele and they were just another thief, um, they could just as easily you know, get the guards to open up the safe, get the private keys, sweep the Bitcoin, as they could go to BlackRock and sell, you know. But they don't have the court system and the precedent that other countries do. So it it's an unstable. I know Bukele's I'm doing- you, if, you if, you're in if you're the leader of a country and you're a, you're a thief, you can steal the money wherever it is. Of course especially in a country like that, yeah. where the rule of law is not set up. Yeah. If somebody did that in a more advanced, or let's just say that if somebody did that in the United States, if, a, if an elected official walked into a vault and stole some gold with armed guards, even if they didn't harm anybody, he's gonna be tried and convicted. Mm -hmm. It's like nobody, I know we like to think that bankers are above the law and for the most part, it, the empirical study is that they are, that's really unfortunate. That's what part of my whole research process is dedicated towards is bringing that to light and that bankers operate outside of the law. Most everyone else has to operate within the law, especially if you steal physical property in is, the United States, you're going to get convicted for it. It is such a fascinating idea of who controls the private keys. Is it the president and his brothers? And how's it how's it passed on? How does succession happen with that? But but it's just interesting. But mm. Bukele is just a maverick. It's not. I'm not trying to diminish his impact yeah. or what he's doing. He is an example of how to stick it to the man, 
how to raise the middle finger, how to go anti IMF, mm-hmm. how to go anti Davos. He is the he is the prototype for all of that. But if he if he steals all the Bitcoin and walks away, the price probably doesn't even budge probably a fucking cent. <laughs> Uh, did you see Eric Voorhees tweet about it? Uh, he said, give it all to the citizens, is that right? Yeah, he said he was commending Michael Saylor and criticizing Bukele. Oh, let me pull it up. I'm thinking of a different one. Yeah. So he says, Saylor deserves respect for acting with conviction with his own money and that which was voluntarily invested with him. Bukele deserves condemnation for uh, ingratiating himself with money stolen from taxpayers. They are not the same. <laughs> That's a proper libertarian. Yeah. Position. Uh, yeah, how do you think um, financial financial services is going to involve the Bitcoin? And do you think there's any chance, because of the way Bitcoin is, maybe one of these last large institutions will end up wrecked? The ETF managers will one of them end up wrecked, or somebody else? Because the ETF managers are pretty constricted in what they can do. Right. But leverage is going to intertwine with Bitcoin over the next many years and that will bring its own risks. I'm thinking about what Bitcoin can do to balance the books of banks as it's an asset that as Bitcoin has been called uh, been called a triple entry accounting Double entry accounting means that two banks are making the adjustment. Just two banks, that's the double. But with the triple entry, then others can view what the two banks did, and that is a game changer. And I hope that Bitcoin will revolutionize banking and bank balance sheets. That is going into my second book. Okay. And I'm going to map that out, but I'm currently in the process of mapping out how Bitcoin fixes double entry accounting in that when a, when the financial system expands, it's two banks agreeing with each other to expand the financial system without the understanding of every other bank. And they're all self-governed in the rules that they follow. So they just do whatever the hell they want. With Bitcoin as a balancing mechanism, it puts a restriction on what the banks can do from a leverage standpoint, because their current leverage restrictions are governed by the Basel Committee, for example, it's run out of the Bank of International Settlements in Switzerland as well as their own holdings of treasuries and what they can do in terms of balance sheet manipulation. So I'm optimistic that Bitcoin can serve a role to address a lot of banking fraudulent money creation. That's the big picture and that's going into my second book. But were they really? (laughs) I, listen, that's what I'm here for. Because we've got competition now. I am, I am envisioning the entire Bitcoin future, where Bitcoin goes all the way. Okay. Well, all the way is? All the way is the ultimate measuring stick for banks, people, governments, individuals. It's the unit of account of the, balance, of the aggregate balance sheet of the world. At the moment, is that treasuries? No. At the moment, it doesn't exist. Hmm. In the dollar system, treasuries play an outsized role. We've talked about this a lot. It's obviously the first layer of money in the US dollar system in the layered money framework, which is why you asked the question. Yes, it plays a big role. And yes, if you have treasuries on your balance sheet, it allows you to create money. I can walk you through how that happens if you want. But Treasuries do allow you to create money in today's financial system. So they have a lot of power. But they don't settle the books because the 
U.S. government can always create more of them. And the ability to pledge treasuries as collateral is an opaque process. Mm. So the, the asset itself is not limited in supply and is discretionary by the U.S. government, Congress plus the executive branch. And the banks themselves, the games that they play with those treasury assets are games, evolve. They're trying to skirt regulations at all times. They're trying to change laws in their own country, and they're trying to get Basel to change what they're going to allow. We saw just recently, let's change so that treasuries don't cost us anything on our balance sheet. We can basically hold unlimited treasuries, which, again, so the answer to your question is no. They're not. There's no measuring stick. There is no measuring stick. That's on the asset side and the liability side, there's definitely not. That's the corruption of the dollar itself. So the dollar is a liability and there is no limit and there is no measuring stick. The measuring stick is, is now Bitcoin. It used to be gold. Gold died. Uh, gold Old statement. <laughs> That's a bulb. <laughs> just throw it in there. Peter Schiff's not going to be happy with you here. It's gold, just hit a record all time high. Gold died, and now it exists as a, a collectible asset <coughs> that can do very well because it's property. When did it die? 2009. I used to think that it died between 68 and 73. 70, you know, 71 was the closing of the gold window. 68 was the closing of the gold pool. And 73 was the year in which currency started to float against each other. I've now started to realize that gold died in the 30s with Executive Order 6102, as well as the British fall of the gold standard in 1931. Those happened around the same time, 33, 31. That is the new take on when gold died. So it's been a hundred years since gold really mattered because the games they play, it's like the games they play with gold, they won the game and they didn't need physical. That's why Germany never asked for the gold back because it died. It didn't, it died. It didn't need to be involved yeah. and it's not involved. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a bad asset. It's an asset. It's property. It can't be, it can't be created by banks. So it might out, it might out um, perform cash, which is a, dump, a dumpster fire. But gold is dead. Bitcoin is the new measuring stick. It is also incredibly volatile. So c therefore preventing people from viewing it as the measuring stick. But now, and this is back to my brain melting around the numbers of late, what we see is the realization that it's the measuring stick is accelerating outside of the country. Okay. And, and that is like with all the sheikhs and emirs realizing that they desperately need it, that's going to move the needle way more than Nigeria Bukele is going to move the needle. It's just, they have way more money. Their wealth is much more physically oriented. They're understanding the physicality of Bitcoin. It's just numbers, but it's extremely physical and tangible. I'm remembering using the word tangible, Trace Mayer, when he talked about the tangibility of Bitcoin because it's numbers, so you can touch it. And people that understand property, listen, Sailor said it enough times. All three of my most watched videos on YouTube are Michael Saylor about property, Michael Saylor about corporate finance. It's like, what are ours property, doing? property, property. What are ours? I bet sailors up there. Uh, definitely. 
we might have sneaked Bukele in there. In your Hazard, order. obviously Whitney Webb. Yeah. Michael Saylor, Winnie Webber, Mark Goodwin, Saylor, Bukele. <laughs> bit, of, bit of conspiracy in there for us. <laughs> Listen, I um, am reading Whitney Webb's book, and it is um, it was just tremendously researched. She's pretty incredible. I have to I have to choose what I where I spend my time reading, um, and that my goal is to one day just be able to read all day. But I have to work and. And I have to make, you know, I have to make videos and I have to write research letters and I have to write a book. Mm -hmm. And so I can't spend all my time reading every, so because I love to go into the end notes and footnotes and bibliographies and go Google and go read and buy another book and just go down rabbit holes. So once I finish my own book, I'm going to, and I, by the way, I've gone through her book to look for banking anecdotes. Because I'm talking about banks and banking. I'm not explicitly talking about banking corruption and corrupt people that are associated with banks and the relationships that they've had, but rather the role that banks have in controlling money and, and, the, issuance, and the issuance of money. Not even having anything to do with Bitcoin, okay. but just why the dollar is corrupted itself. It's because okay. the banks can do whatever the hell they want. When's the book going to be ready? Ish. The book will be with you guys um, in this summer. The book will be with everybody this summer. Everyone or us too? With everyone. With everyone. Can we have it first? Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's, um, there's, a, there's a bunch of people that I'm sending this book to before it's out mm -hmm. because layered money was something very personal and unique. And I was in, a, I was in, a, I was in an interesting position in my life in which there was a very solo project. But this time I'm writing what I hope to be the anthology of Bitcoin. And so I want to make sure that it is done right. And wow. I'm going to rely on others for some help to make sure that I haven't missed anything or that I've not got anything wrong because the stakes are too high. I'm taking it very seriously and personally to write the anthology of Bitcoin. Sounds like Rizzo would need to see a copy of that to help you with that. He's done some great work, <laughs> and I really want to have him on the show to talk about Satoshi. Yeah, you so, should. Pete, if you're listening, I, uh, there's a DM in your inbox. Listen, I, w I want people to know that I, in addition to me writing this anthology of Bitcoin, I live, breathe, and sleep Bitcoin and global macro research. And research means reading and crunching numbers. And I have a, a new data tool. It's not even that new. My uh, viewers will know my macro bond charts. This tool has reinvigorated my research process. And there's just so much more to come as uh, from, from this researcher here. Right, go check out the Bitcoin layer. We'll put everything in the show notes. Check out Nick's videos, his book, everything he's doing. Yeah, should we go and eat? Absolutely. Right, see you later, everyone. Cheers.